good morning, Sulphur Well, and our guest out there. It is good to be with you. It is September the 12th, second Sunday in September. As a reminder, we'll have our outdoor service later this morning at 9 a.m. under our pavilion space. And I did have some uh, a special in news information to share with you, and that is there's a new Wednesday night class starting up this coming Wednesday night, September the 15th, at 6 p.m. in the cafe. The title of the class is God's Heart for Mental Health. It's going to be taught by a friend of mine, uh, Adam Currents, who is a mental health professional. Excited about this class. Seems like mental health is a very relevant topic for uh, believers to kind of be considering and walking through. And so that starts this Wednesday night. God's Heart for Mental Health. Feel free and share that information with others. All right, let's go to God in prayer and we'll get started. Holy God, we thank you for today. Grateful to be in this uh, space to spend some time in your word. We just ask that you uh, speak to us. Use your spirit to mold us into people who look and act like Jesus. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't know if the name Dan Gable means anything to you. He was in the news a little bit last year. He received a Presidential Medal of Freedom, which is uh, not too shabby. Uh, he is probably uh, the greatest American freestyle wrestler and maybe also the greatest college wrestling coach of all time. He has made a career in the industry of wrestling. Uh, not the professional wrestling that you see on TV, but the very competitive wrestling that you see in the Olympics, etc. Mr. Gable was raised, born and raised in Iowa. He went on to attend Iowa State University. And while he was there wrestling collegiately, his record was 117 and 1. 117 and 1. He was the runner-up to a national title, and he won two national titles while wrestling collegiately at Iowa State University. In the 1972 Olympics, he won gold. He had six matches in those Olympics. And if you know anything about wrestling, you'll know how impressive this is. In all six matches, he never surrendered a point to his opponent. It was very, very good. In 1976, he became the head coach of the Iowa State wrestling team. And over a 22-year period, he had a record of 355 and 21. It's pretty good. He coached 152 All-Americans, 45 national champions, 106 Big Ten champions, 12 Olympians. He won 21 Big Ten Conference title championships, 15 national championships. I think the most impressive thing about Mr. Gable is just imagine what you would picture. A guy who was a collegiate national championship wrestler, Olympic gold medal winner as a wrestler, and then a head coach as a wrestler. Are you ready for this? Mr. Gable is 5'9 and weighs about 150 pounds. And so he, he is not a big man, but I'm sure very, very tough. Uh, I didn't know a lot about freestyle wrestling until my son started doing it a few years ago. And uh, it is very intense. It's very physical. There's a, an intimacy to it. It's difficult and it's hard. Uh, you're hearing my dog Ace kind of scramble around. And so that's, I'm, I'm recording from home today. All right, so if Ace makes an appearance, just wave and we'll keep moving on. Uh, but freestyle wrestling is very, very hard because you get matched against people who are your size and skill level. And that basically assures there's no easy matches. It's meant to be this match that's a toss up where you could beat them or they could beat you. It engages all of your muscles and it's physically and mentally draining and exhausting. I bring up wrestling because we're going to talk about a character who is famous for wrestling. In fact, I'll just pose that question to you. When you think about wrestling and you think about scripture, who do you think of? Well, you probably answered Jacob, right? Jacob is famous for that. We'll get to that story here in just a minute. And Jacob happens to be the next character that the Hebrew writer introduces for us. In Hebrews 11, this chapter that we've been moving through with these heroes of faith. Hebrews 11, verse 20, By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. By faith Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshipped as he leaned on the top of his staff. All right, let's talk about Jacob for just a little bit. Last week we spent time in the Abraham story, specifically looking at Abraham and Isaac and Sarah and we talked about some of the not-so-pleasant family dynamics that are present uh, in that story in their lives. Well, the apple does not fall far from the tree. 
Jacob is the son of Isaac, and his home is also fairly messy. In fact, Jacob's entrance into the world is pretty inauspicious. And so we find that story in Genesis 25, verse 21. There it says, Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless. The Lord answered his prayer, and his wife Rebekah became pregnant. The babies jostled each other within her, and she said, Why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. The Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, two peoples from within you, you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the other or the older will serve the younger. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first one to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment. So they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. The boys grew up, and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. All right, so we have a very traditional, or non-traditional, I should say, pregnancy story. Rebekah appears to be barren, like she's not going to have a child. Isaac prays to the Lord on her behalf. She becomes pregnant, but the pregnancy is difficult, right? It says the babies jostle, or we might say wrestle within her. She asks God, what's going on? And he reveals that something bigger is happening in her womb, that this, these two nations are wrestling. The older will serve the younger. Now, for us, it seems obvious that she's having twins because we know how the rest of the story goes, but the text doesn't lead you to that conclusion. If you read verse 24 again, um, in fact, let me back up and read it here. i got to pull it back up. It says, When the time came for her to give birth, there were twins in her womb. Some translations say, Behold, there were twins in her womb. So this idea that they weren't quite sure there was more than one baby there. So the first baby comes out, it's Esau, right? He's named that way because he's red and he's hairy. His name refers to that. And there's also another connection to his name. Esau is connected to this Hebrew word that means like doer, like worker, like hard worker is really kind of the connotation there. And that fits with what we know about Esau. But then Jacob comes out grasping Esau's hill. That's why they call him Jacob because his name literally means to grasp the hill. But it's really the idea behind the name that we're interested in. It means supplanter. It's this idea that someone is ahead of you and you're, you're pulling on them to pull them back so that you can pass them or overcome them, hence wrestling, right? Something you might do in wrestling. And boy, does this describe Jacob. Jacob will go on to wrestle with just about every significant person in his life. His brother, his father, his mother at times, his father-in-law, his wife, or I should say wives, his children. Jacob's life is marked with strife. It's marked with difficulty. It's marked with hardship. It is not a storybook. Now, that's not to say there aren't good things that happen to him, but if there's a character, particularly in the Old Testament, who seems to always get good stuff the hard way, uh, that is certainly Jacob. That describes Jacob. And that theme culminates in the story from Genesis 32. And that's where we're going to spend the rest of our time, Genesis 32, if you want to turn over there. So, in Genesis 32, Jacob is about to meet Esau. Why is that important? Well, for many years, Jacob has been in exile from his family. You might remember that he, with his mother's help, enacted a plan where he stole the blessing and inheritance from his older brother, deceiving his father, and Jacob had to leave home because his father was very angry and his brother was seeking to kill him. And years have passed, and now his brother has caught up with him. They're going to have a reunion the next day. Genesis 32 is the night before. And there's a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of stress. Jacob's not sure how Esau will respond. He knows when he left home, Esau sought to kill him. Has he gotten over that? Does he still feel that way? Is he more angry and more bitter? Jacob does not know. And then in Genesis 32, this really bizarre story happens. Let's look at it. Verse 22, That night Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven sons, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. 
When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, Let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, What is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, Your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, Please tell me your name. But he replied, Why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, It is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. Crazy story, right? Really bizarre story. We know some things that Jacob learns later or figures out later in the story. He's wrestling God, right? I don't know if he knows that initially, kind of figures that out. Probably figures that out that after a night of wrestling, this guy, in the Hebrew, it says like he barely touches his hip. And that was enough to end Jacob's wrestling days probably forevermore. His hip was wrenched. And the idea being there was like permanently injured. But what is interesting is the aftermath of the match, right? Jacob gets his name changed. He gets his name changed to Israel. And what does Israel mean? Well, you may have a footnote there in your Bible. It means the one who wrestles with God or or wrestling with God. Now, is that a good name change or a bad name change? Why don't you think about that for just a second? Is that a good name change or a bad name change? Well, what does God say? God says your name is being changed because you have struggled with God and humans and have overcome, right? God seems to indicate that this is a, it's a compliment. It's a good thing. In the Hebrew, it, the name really is sort of neutral. It just means wrestles with God. But the question is, well, what, what's the outcome, right? I mean, if I told you my son wrestled competitively last weekend, many of you would probably ask, well, how did he do, right? Because that determines what you think about the wrestling. The name is also open-ended here. It's to be determined, and God kind of fills in that blank. He says that you have overcome God and men. Well, is wrestling with God good or bad? What do you think? Is wrestling with God good or bad? You know, something we don't readily say about this story is God showed up intending to wrestle with Jacob. I mean, think about it for a second. The the outcome was this name change and God giving Jacob blessing. God could have done that without wrestling with him, right? I mean, he easily just could have just shown up and said, hey, got uh, a form here, sign this, your name is now Israel, and by the way, here's a blessing, boom, have a good night's rest, good luck meeting your brother tomorrow. You gotta do that, right? God shows up intending to wrestle with him to give him this blessing. And that is a profound thought. Let me repeat that. God shows up in, in Jacob's world to wrestle with the outcome being that he will give him blessing. You know, when we look at the cross of Jesus Christ, this is a term, but I promise it circles back. Many of us just see salvation, right? We, we see the cross and we understand it as God's defeat over sin and the evil of this world. And it gives us the hope of a better reality beyond the grave, right? All those things are true. I'm not trying to devalue. Those are very important things. But what if there's even more to the cross? What if the cross is also a lens at which we are to see God brings blessing into this world? Let me repeat that. What what if the cross embodies this methodology that God often enacts to bring about blessing in this world? And so not just at the cross, the one-time event of Jesus' death, but rather that, that, that idea of what happens there is emblematic of how God works in this world. If you think about it that way, it brings a lot of meaning to a lot of stuff. One, consider what Paul says in Romans 8, 28. You probably know this text. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Right? It's kind of the point Paul is making here that these wrestlings that we do in life, these things that look more like the cross than things that are more pleasant in Jesus' life, maybe they are the vehicles and mediums by which God can bring about good, just like he does with the cross, right? Or blessings, as in the case of Jacob. You know, I'll I'll go further. Maybe God even intends those things for that purpose. Again, God showed up intending to wrestle Jacob. Do you think it was easy for Jacob to wrestle with God? 
No, right? Scripture seems to indicate that he probably has trouble with his hip the rest of his life. We might assume that he limps the rest of his life, maybe needs a cane. But you know something I bet is true? Imagine the joy Jacob must have gotten out of telling people why he walked with a limp. Think about that, right? When people asked, hey, Jake, why do you have a cane? Right? Well, what happened there? Did an animal kick you? you know, do you have a fall? What, what's going on there? Imagine the smile that must have entered Jacob's face as he began to tell them the story of how he wrestled with God and overcame, right? Some of you are wrestling right now, wrestling with your job, wrestling with your school, wrestling with your family, wrestling with your church, right? I'm not naive. Some of you are wrestling right now. What if that wrestling isn't bad luck, isn't just a rough patch, isn't just a life giving you a tough hand, you know? What if those things you are wrestling with right now, God is intending to bring about blessing to you? That God's intent is for you to wrestle for a while with fill in the blank. I want to go back to Jacob one more time. Genesis 32 verse 25, when the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. You know, when God touches Jacob's hip, he intends on an ending the match. That's what the text seems to indicate. But who holds on? Jacob holds on. That is something, right? That Jacob would not let go until God had blessed him. I love that part of the story, that he held on to God in the wrestling. In the moment of the worst pain of the wrestling, he held on to God. Yeah, sit with it for a second. When the pain was the worst, in the midst of the wrestling, Jacob gripped tighter and would not let go of God until he got the good out of it, until he got the blessing out of it. Can I offer you encouragement that I think Jacob kind of speaks to us from ancient words, hold on in the wrestling, right? Continue to hold on to God. I know it may hurt. I know it may forever change you, certainly forever changed Jacob, right? But hold on, have faith in the promise of God. And we know that in all things, God works for good. Those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Is that not the nature of faith? To hold on to God in the midst of the wrestling, in the moment of the worst pain, knowing that just like with Jacob, just like with the cross of Christ, that this pain and this wrestling has meaning and blessing because that's the sort of God we serve and call on. Let's pray. Holy God, we thank you for the story of Jacob. We're grateful for his persistence. We're grateful for his, his faith and his determination. May we approach life in your name in a very similar way. Some of us are wrestling right in this very moment. Some of us may be in the worst of the wrestling, uh, where it hurts the most. And uh, I pray for deeper faith. I pray for people to hold on and, and grip tighter and to see things through knowing that you work all things for good for those that love you and are called according to your purpose. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. I've enjoyed my time with you this morning. As always, I want to leave you with a blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he smile upon you and bring you peace. Have a great day.